Okay, welcome back. Now we're going to be covering Fractures 201. We're going to be talking first about a hematoma block, which when it comes to fractures in the emergency department uh, is extremely helpful. It uh, can help alleviate the need for procedural sedation, uh, which as we know ties you up for at least 20 minutes typically, if not uh, much longer. So, um, we want to talk about recreating the fracture or making it worse before better. Talk about uh, the fact that sometimes you're destined to fail and uh, the variability in consultants. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about videos. Uh, we will not put the videos into this lecture. Uh, there will be a separate document that has links for those videos. We also will put the web addresses in here for the videos. So, there are a few indications for prompt reduction. Uh, to alleviate pain is one. To relieve tension on nerves or vessels, so if you feel that uh, there's an issue with the circulation or the nerve conduction. And finally, uh, I'm sorry, the next is to prevent uh, conversion to open fracture. We typically consider that tenting of the skin. Uh, so that's the big issue with tenting of the skin. Uh, well, it's two issues. Number one, you can cut the blood supply to the skin, and then number two, the bone can work its way out the skin. Um, and that would be a conversion to an open fracture. Uh, you want to restore the circulation to a pulseless extremity. These are indications for uh, the kind of bite on a bullet, and let's go ahead and pull this back in as quickly as possible, or possibly give them a little bit of uh, pain medicine like fentanyl, uh, which is a good uh, narcotic to use for this. So, uh, for hematoma block, you know, can help a lot if you have a little bit more time. Supplies for that, you want a 21 or 22 gauge needle. Um, the, if you go much larger than that, you end up with quite a large track leading down to your fracture, hence making it possibly an open fracture. If you end up using a lot smaller, then you're not going to be able to pull blood back through, and that's, a, that's an important part of this procedure. For an adult, you want to use 5 to 10 cc's and 1% lidocaine or 0.5% bupivacaine. Put that in a 10 cc syringe. You could also put that in a 20 cc syringe. It would just allow you a little more space to mix. Uh, you want to also have an antiseptic for the skin. Again, you don't want to track any bacteria down to the fracture, hence making it an open fracture. So, you want to first start by aspirating as you're going uh, inserting the needle. That will help you know that you're in the right area. Uh, you really just want to aim for the, the easiest spot to hit the fracture is really where you're going. There will be typically a large hematoma around those fracture ends. Um, you want to inject half the contents of the syringe, and then the next thing you want to do, wait a few seconds, and then go ahead and aspirate that back out. You'll typically at that point get a mixture of the lidocaine and blood. Then you're going to inject that back in, and you're going to go back and forth on that several times. That'll help mix that local anesthetic throughout the area of the fracture. So for this, the hematoma block, there's really poor video on the first link there, um, but it does show the repeated aspiration injection method. The second one's a better video, but it's just a straight injection. I really found that doesn't work as well. Uh, the second one, though, does have a pretty sweet soundtrack. So once you've got that anesthetized, when you go to reduce a fracture, the typical um, kind of Ma uh, mantra of orthopedics is that you want to recreate the fracture. I find that very confusing, personally. Um, the best thing I've found to describe is that you kind of want to make the fracture worse before making it better. Um, you know, so if you've got some angulation, you actually want to accentuate that uh, before you start to try to correct it. The uh, distal radius fractures are a classic one for this. For those, you typically want to put them in finger traps and you want to get the bone back out to length before you attempt a reduction um, and that's really advantageous for just about any reduction that you're going to try to do is try to get that back out to length if you can uh, obviously if it's um, overlapped a little bit shortened so um, the splint must hold the final position which is also very important some fractures just are not going to reduce. You know, the angulation may be too much, the muscles may be too strong, uh, there's something blocking the reduction. Um, an injury pattern such as a Galeazzi fracture, 
with a radial fracture and an ulnar dislocation is well known to be nearly impossible to reduce and be able to splint. That is going to be a surgical fix. Uh, so you really want to talk to your consultant, um, especially when it's a pretty significant fracture, and see if they want you to go ahead and give it a shot or if you really just need to have them follow up or send them to the OR. So um, obviously there's a variability in consultants. We know this with every specialty. Um, you know, we really want to talk to them when it comes to some of these because you may just end up wasting your time. And obviously when you're wasting your time, you're wasting all the other patients in the emergency department. So we want to just try to stay on top of that. Um, you know, there are some that are very aggressive versus conservative. Uh, we know that with things like clavicle fractures. Uh, right now at WVU, there are um, a couple of our surgeons are pretty aggressive at fixing clavicle fractures. While even here at our own institution, we have a couple that um, are still quite conservative and um, let those go. So, got some videos. Again, uh, these will be the links here. You can copy them down or you can pull up that other document. And uh, when you really get down to think about it, there's very few fractures that we actually reduce in the emergency department. Many of those are going to be uh, kind of distal fractures. So, distal radius is a common one that uh, you'll be asked to do in many emergency departments. So there's a couple links there you should go and watch. Uh, boxer's fracture reduction, again, there's a couple links there. And then the second one has an ulnar gutter splint uh, along with it. Ankle fracture dislocation. Now, these are typically easy to reduce. You can read that as unstable, <laughs> um, which means you better have a pretty darn good splint. Mid shaft femur. So, uh, mid shaft femur obviously is not one that we're going to reduce um, definitively, um, but you can help with tamponade of blood as well as uh, helping reduce pain. Uh, you may be uh, improving circulation to the rest of the leg as well as uh, the nerve conduction. So, uh, hair traction splint, there's a, a nice video here that I've linked. So open fractures. Uh, we're going to end with this. Open fractures are an orthopedic emergency, right? There's there's a few things that are orthopedic emergencies. Open fractures are definitely one of those. Uh, that's why with every fracture, you really need to inspect and look for any lacerations around the fracture. Uh, you first want to worry about hemorrhage control. Um, Splinting that uh, plus minus reduction, uh, maybe just splinting it just to keep it from you know moving around a bunch. Uh, copious irrigation is going to be important for this. Uh, obviously, analgesia, antibiotics, and tetanus prophylaxis uh, we want to be thinking about. And this is an emergent orthopedic consultation if you haven't already figured that out. So, is it or is it not an open fracture? Uh, that is always going to be your question. So, for classification of open fractures, uh, grade one has a laceration size of less than one centimeter, considered lower energy. Um, antibiotics are typically considered cefazolin, uh, especially with no allergies, and uh, with minimal contamination, we'll just go with the one agent. For grade two, the laceration size is going to be one to five centimeters, uh, forces moderate energy. Uh, you may have some soft tissue loss here, but it should be minimal. Um, and obviously with the larger wound, we're going to consider that moderate contamination. We're going to go ahead and add gentamicin to our antibiotic coverage. Grade 3, we have extensive soft tissue stripping. Uh, that would be A. A B would have periosteal stripping. And a grade uh, 3C would have major vascular injury. Laceration size is greater than 5 centimeters. That's a high energy wound. Uh, contamination is extensive. These typically have a very prolonged uh, wound course. Uh, many times we'll have to have uh, wound vacs. And uh, in addition to the cefazolin and genomycin, we're going to add some penicillin. And the reason for the penicillin is clostridium. So our antibiotics, again, just for a recap. Cefazolin is the first line, adding gentamicin for second, and then penicillin G for clostridium coverage. So in summary, I want to remember that for fractures, uh, especially for fracture reduction, we want adequate anesthesia or possibly sedation. You want to go ahead and recreate the fracture pattern, and again I like to call that making it worse before making it better. 
Uh, you want to know your limitations, which sometimes will involve a call to your consultants. And then finally, the splint is critical. And so we're going to talk about splinting in the next lecture. Remember, you want to have uh, three points of compression on your splint. Um, depending on the way you're angulated, uh, you want to have kind of two on the opposite side from the angulation and, and uh, then the one right over the, uh, the fracture being on the, from the side that the uh, angulation is pointed to.